All right. So we'll officially get started. So good evening, everybody. Uh, we welcome the class Megan Barnes from the Landscape Architecture Foundation, who's a great friend and colleague and fellow Wolverine. So uh, we'll, we'll be go blue and all day today. It's nothing but maize and blue for you people. Uh, but she was gracious enough to come in and uh, talk about uh, landscape performance series and respond to the questions that you all generated. So thank you to this week's group um, for generating those questions. So as we did with Austin uh, a couple weeks ago, we're gonna turn it over to that student team to lead us through. Um, we invite you to write questions in the chat or uh, when the time is right, go ahead and ask them. Um, but with that, I'd like to hand it over to the students and let them take it away. Great, thank you, Kofi. And thank you so much, um, Megan, for being here with us tonight. So we have generated five questions for you, which we uh, put together after reviewing the readings that Kofi shared with us. Uh, as Kofi clarified, most of them focused on landscape performance series related issues. So my colleagues who generated the questions are Adam, Michaela, Kat, Lauren, and C, and they along the way may ask, ask uh, follow-up questions during our conversation. So I'm gonna share my screen and we can get started. So let's get started with a question about your personal experience. So we're curious to know that, uh, what motivated you to become involved in landscape performance and in what ways have you seen landscape performance analysis change over time? Are there any trends emerging in the types of projects that people are submitting to the LPS? Excellent questions. I guess, yeah, to start off, thank you for having me. Your questions are awesome. Um, some of them will challenge me more than others, for sure. This is the easiest one, um, but potentially the longest answer. Um, so I guess for the first piece, I mean, the simple answer is that I took a job at LAF. But it, it really goes a lot deeper than that. And I think that's something that you can all relate to as students. So when I was doing my MLA at Michigan, uh, I loved landscape architecture. And honestly, I, I joined, you know, I was out of the Peace Corps, kind of thinking about the relationship between people and the land. But going in, I was mostly excited about the pretty gardens and the plants and, you know, I, the, the typical things that, that you might think of with landscape architecture. Um, but because the program at Michigan was was really focused on the environment, it, it kind of it made me realize how functional our work can really be. And, you know, I, I'm sure you've been to those reviews where it can be a little boring sometimes where it's, oh, I came up with this park design, you know, it's in the shape of a seashell to symbolize the sea, you know, I planted this flower and this flower and this shrub and all of these things. And, you know, here's my palette for spring, summer, fall. And all that can be really great, when, especially when it's well done, but it left something lacking, I think, in, in my sense of purpose uh, in the world, which again, coming off of Peace Corps, I, I feel like I ha had a well-developed sense of purpose. So it was it was hard to, to go from this, from that to just talking about aesthetics. And I was at school with others. Um, you know, it was, it was in the School of Natural Resources. So I was surrounded by sustainability students, ecology, environmental justice students. And I often felt, you know, when I would join in their classes that my design ideas couldn't keep up with the issues that they were talking about. So I really learned to pay attention to what they were interested in, um, you know, looking beyond the landscape architects around me. You know, they were talking about how the design of cities, you know, relegates poor neighborhoods, often communities of color, to, to places that predetermine health outcomes for them. Um, you know, the role of healthy forests, you know, the ecologists are focused on that. Um, you know, they also, a major thing that these students, as well as, of course, the faculty and other departments taught me to be skeptical of journal articles, you know, how to read a journal article with a, a critical eye and understand really what you're looking at, um, which is hugely important when looking at landscape performance and understanding what's good research and what is uh, maybe not so so, so rigorous uh, or applicable to your work. Um, so of course, I started seeing that that information on landscape performance was invaluable. And funnily enough, I didn't have much to do with the landscape performance series in school. I wish I would have. I think it would have changed a lot of things. Um, but that's certainly where I started asking these questions. And I think, you know, we've all had at some point that 
scary studio crit where you kind of feel like you did nothing right and you know no matter how nice your reviewers are you you feel like you kind of didn't come with your best um but but i do find that you know if you come to a crit armed with a sense of what the benefits of your work can be if you can say you know i project or i think that my design would improve water quality by 80 percent. i think it would save 600 dollars on energy bills every month i think it would have xyz impact on physical activity levels or improve quality of life things like that you know the people in your crit might ask how you got all of those numbers but the fact that you have them puts you way ahead of the ball game of this uh, as far as you know a studio crit goes so seeing all of that you know taking the job at laf uh, when it came up five years ago now was a no-brainer um it sort of was a way to address that imposter syndrome i like to think of it as a form of imposter syndrome as a designer where you're always making these claims about your work that you at the time especially as a student i had no idea if they were true i didn't have the practice experience to to know that um so at least when you're using the landscape performance series and when you're looking at other existing projects you can you could see that real information so yeah i guess that's the long answer but uh and then how have I seen landscape performance analysis change over time? Uh, it's probably a much longer story, but I'll try to try to kind of summarize it. Um, when I started at LAF in 2017, there was still a lot of momentum surrounding landscape performance, and there still is, but there, it was 2015 and 2016 was kind of a golden age um, in that we saw a lot of journal articles coming out, um, a lot of presentations at conferences that really did focus on landscape performance. And I think, you know, you all have seen or you might see in your careers that landscape architecture research uh, in its pure sense doesn't have the highest profile. So if you think about the medical profession, you know, there's constant journals coming out, the, the newest research, doctors are reading these, these journals all the time to keep up uh, with their skills. Landscape architects do this, but to a much, much lesser degree, right? You know, if you, if you get certified in your state, uh, if you become a licensed landscape architect, you will have to keep up to some extent, but it's just not the rigor that, that you'll see in medical journals. And that being said, I don't want to diminish the role of landscape architecture research, because there's some really important impactful landscape architecture research coming out of the profession. But traditionally, it's been considered less impactful than, than other forms of research or other, other disciplines. Um, so we've been very quick to borrow from other disciplines, right? So we've looked to sociologists to help us measure the social value of our spaces. We've looked to health professionals for health outcomes, public health people, um, hydrologists for stormwater, um, engineers for certain measurements. And of course, to a degree, we absolutely should be doing this. Um, we need that knowledge to, to round out um, the understanding of our landscapes. Um, and you'll see that in the landscape performance series, we do, we borrow from other disciplines quite a bit. But designers and specifically landscape architects have their own research interests and their own research questions that they want answered. Uh, you know, we may be interested in finding things out about our designs that a hydrologist or an engineer or a psychologist may not be interested in. So in that sense, in, in general, um, I would say another sort of trend related to landscape performance is um, practice-based research, which is a really hot hot topic today in the in the discipline um it's been around a while but it's it's starting to be talked about more and it's still even a little bit un, up for debate what it actually means uh but the way i think of it is integrating research often landscape performance related research into the design practice so into practice actually creating built work to to test different ideas right um and again, that being said, there's there's a few different ways to look at practice based research, but we, we won't go into that now. Um, and then another sort of major way that landscape performance research has changed over time is just in the in what people want to measure right um, what we want to measure about our projects varies greatly by project, but it also varies as our projects overall change and so you know back in you know the 90s it was all about stormwater you know we really really like woke up to stormwater and wanted to focus on that um and additionally environmental benefits are often a little bit easier to measure than social or economic so um that was a little bit more common in the earlier years but today obviously some huge topics are really that diversity equity inclusion justice 
are is huge, as well as um, climate change. Uh, of course, the interest in these topics aren't new, but we're starting to really wonder what our landscapes do uh, do in these areas. Um, so people are coming to us to ask how to measure things like justice, and we can talk more about that. But uh, it's it's a tricky it's a tricky thing, um, and we don't have all the answers for that yet. But by any means, so that's that's an emerging area that I see a lot of uh, faculty and and others interested in. Climate, um, you know, performance and. and performance data on kind of how stormwater infrastructure might be performing, especially for sites that are affected by more direct climate impacts like sea level rise, uh, you know, heat and severe heat impacts, uh, damage from severe events like hurricanes, things like that. It's very hard to measure in just one case study. There is no perfect climate change case study. And so we're working out what that means and show what our little small in interventions in some cases mean in this larger conversation of the changing climate, um, as well as you know decarbonization, right? Uh, you can plant a lot of trees on a site, but generally uh, tree planting is not gonna be sufficient um, for your for your site. So even starting to look at more cutting edge mass decarbonization techniques that we can use in our in our landscapes. Um, yeah, so it's, I'd say those are the big trends right now. Um, and then I guess the last kind of piece of that any trends and types of projects. It's hard to pick out trends that way because the people who submit submit well, they submit because their projects are strong, but they also submit because they're interested in landscape performance and they want to learn how to do this, right? So I don't think it's it's self-selecting for any specific type of project other than they do have to be sustainability related. You know, it's your just standard parking lot project is probably not a fit for, for this, so they're not applying. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, I would say we just get a wide range every year. Some years we might have more streetscapes or some years we might have more green roofs. Uh, some years we'll always have a million parks, a lot of waterfront projects, things like that. But um, I don't know that I would say that there's a significant trend in project types, except that sometimes we get cool new things. Uh, like we had our first pop-up project uh, during my time, which was exciting. And I, I hope we can have more of those um, first eco lodge, things like that. Yeah, hopefully that answer. I'm happy to answer any follow up on any of that. Thanks. Yeah, I definitely want to make space for any follow up questions that arose um, for our group or others in the class about Megan's personal experience or trends in landscape performance analysis. Hi, Megan. Hi, I was wondering if you could talk more about some of those cutting edge tools that you were uh, just touched on and in, in thinking about carbon sequestration other than planting trees? Yeah, I mean, some of it is wetland, right? Just implementing wetland area. But I mean, if you look at some of Martha Schwartz's work on this, I mean, she's talking about cloud machines and really, really crazy things out there um, that, you know, she's been out there saying landscape architects should be doing this, but there, there aren't really any examples of that so far. So that's sort of what I'm looking for. As far as emerging things, um, the problem is that you know you need a you need quite a bit of funding and backing for a project of that of that scale. Um, yeah, Thank so you. I don't know that I have a lot more examples, but it's uh, especially because there aren't many examples out there built yet, which is really where we live with the landscape performance series. Thank you. I wouldn't mind um, just making sure I understand practice based research. It's kind of going about the design process, anticipating some of that measurement that will be needed or integrating um, measurement yeah, or, from the beginning. Yeah, or it can kind of take it one one step further where it's it's OK, I want to know um, here's Probably the best example I can give you is from our first year of the Deb Mitchell Research Grant, which is a grant program we, we have for landscape architects, but it was given to OJB, um, one of their one of their principals, and she is she wants to know about contaminant levels of vegetation that's along highways because we always like to you know say, oh, vegetation is so great along highways, it creates this buffer, it protects people, but it's also collecting particulate matter and you know how is that affecting human health for the people that you know are, are using those spaces. And so 
they specifically, you know, they're, they're building it, they built a test plot, you know, that, that actually tests that, but it's also, it's also a project, you know, it beautifies that corridor and, and it has value. So um, that's kind of an extreme, I think, extreme example where it really is a research project, but it's, it's sort of that it's done from that practice perspective. It's done either by practitioners or, you know, with, an interested party, which in this case, you know, is the community. I think they're working with the, you know, the transit department. Um, so another example would be uh, Olin has been working to, I don't know the extreme details on this, so hopefully I don't get it wrong, but they've been working to develop a different type of soil medium, I believe it is. Someone might know more than me about this, but, um, and so they've been testing different mixes in their track, in their projects. So it's using the practice and using the design process to, to test different things um, and get outcomes. And again, this is a kind of contested area. So some people might not agree that that's uh, research as practice, but um, we've been talking a lot about it uh, with our Deb Mitchell research grant, which is meant to fund landscape architecture research. And we got we get a lot of proposals from practitioners, which is is unique. You know, they're they're these are billable hours or, or maybe they're not, but they they do projects. And so often what they're trying to investigate is squarely in the realm of the work that they're doing and that's how they can test ideas so it's taking that approach uh, into their bill work thank you that's very helpful i don't know if you all have interaction with ellen deming ever uh, at nc state but she can tell you a lot about practice-based research and yeah in fact um those who are in, enrolled in a class about uh, research and landscape architecture this semester just read her article about that very thing. So yeah, very timely. Um, so let's move on to a question about methodology in the landscape performance series. So LPS methodologies tend to be carried out by teams of academic institutions and professional designers. At the same time, we're noticing that tools that have been tools have emerged that promote citizen science, so measure what matters and ensure equitable design practices, like the seed evaluator. So we're curious to know how might designers integrate these methodologies in landscape performance analyses? Could the methods and metrics in LPS case studies be more accessible to community members perhaps? Yeah, I think citizen science is so key, but what I would really, you know, hope to see is expansion in that area over time, which I think is inevitable. But, you know, some things aren't going to be able to be captured with that sort of more collaborative approach, you know, things like stormwater flow rates, maybe soil quality, I mean, maybe, but um, things like that. But as far as seeing, you know, our smartphones get smarter and smarter, seeing citizen science options go beyond that, you know, obviously, right now, we have things like that look at ecology, we have eBird, iNaturalist, um, which have massive followings, um, but, you know, even going into things potentially in the future, like sound measurement, you know, looking at noise mitigation, I think sound is a little bit of a frontier for landscape architecture that's often ignored. Um, metrics related to safety, there's massive potential as far as, uh, you know, citizen science or citizen data input, basically, data collection. Um, access for people with disabilities in various ways. It's one of the hardest things to measure in our landscapes. And I think that citizen science or citizen input could also be, be important for that. Um, even looking at air quality, you know, air quality is so hard um, to, to measure at a site scale or evaluate at a site scale. So, but, you know, maybe in the future uh, with technology, even getting to the scale of a particular park bench and understanding how, it, how air quality has, has changed there. Um, but of course, for people to, you know, be part of that and to make that these methods and metrics accessible to community members, there has to be buy-in. They have to care about the answers that that these tools will provide. Um, so currently, we see a lot of things where our research teams or designers will put out a QR code on their site, right, and say, "Help us understand our park. Upload to our iNaturalist. Tell us what what animals you've seen in the park." Um, and Typically, they have somewhat low response rates is what is what I've seen, at least through CSI, but that that definitely varies depending on the um, depending on the, the site. Uh, but until 
basically any of this has to be predicated by the relationship with the with the designer and the community and the client. You know, it, it, it has to come down to that. A designer who doesn't know what the community's needs or interests are it, is going to be recommending the use of tools that may not be appropriate or appreciated by the community, right? Um, so I think, you know, as far as designers integrating these methodologies, designers need to be willing to, to throw out methodologies that might not be appropriate and to really have that sensitivity to under, understand that. Um, so I feel like that's kind of a rote answer, but, but it's very true. You know, you can't measure, you shouldn't be measuring something that the community doesn't care about at all um, and enlisting their help for it um, or the, what the client wants. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think in general, we as LAF and the provider of this particular information, we look at designers as being the ones who will get these tools into the hands of the people who might be able to use them if, if it's not just the designer doing the evaluation. I mean, in our case studies, clients are so important and friends of organizations are, are essential. You cannot evaluate a space without their buy-in. Um, so I guess we, we look at designers as that conduit, but the great thing about the resource that we've created is that it's accessible to anyone. It's, it's not just for landscape architects, it's specifically designed to be accessible. And we know from just information we've collected on our usership that there are a lot of others who are not landscape architects who use, use this information. Um, what we do with the program is just break down a lot of those barriers between who, who has the information, right? And, and uh, encouraging that sharing. Um, I have a question just following up from that. Um, I'm wondering just kind of what you, the last thing you said, talking about how there are a lot of other people who are not landscape architects who use this information. I'm wondering if you can kind of touch on that, like who else might this research serve or help? Um, and if it's maybe encourage practitioners outside of landscape architecture or other kind of community members to be more thoughtful or intentional about the spaces they're creating, they're creating or how, how it might contribute there. It's a little bit less sort of sexy of an answer, but we do find uh, I hear from a lot of sort of planning, you know, planners, uh, specifically usually working at a city level, who use uh, these resources, specifically often the fast facts, but to advocate for 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 policies, which this is going to come up, I know, in one of your future questions, but just arguing that you know local regulations should protect trees, you know, that there should be barriers to removing large trees. And so I get feedback that, you know, that our information is being used to take to decision makers to make that argument. And it's definitely not always landscape architects that are making that argument. So yeah, it'll be folks like planners or, or really anybody um, who is trying to save the trees, I guess. Um, but yeah, and then I think we have we have a less complete understanding of sort of community group use of this information. Um, I've definitely spoken, you know, I've, we have a great local um, organization here in DC, Baltimore, uh, called the Neighborhood Design Center, and I know that they use this research a lot because they support community. They're they're basically designers and sort of program managers who support communities in seeking grant funding. And so they'll use uh, this information to sort of beef up grant proposals so that, it, so that if a community is applying for funding for tree planting or for stormwater infrastructure or things like that, they can throw in some sort of these citations and these examples of, of what they can achieve uh, based on what others have achieved or based, what, based on what research says that they might achieve. So I think that's a huge area that we know is happening, but it's very hard to track that, right? Because they don't always come back to us and tell us, hey, we used your, your information in our report, but we certainly know it's happening because we have so many, you know, we have, we catch some of those stories and then we have so many views. Uh, it's, it's yeah, hard to believe that it doesn't make an impact, but something we're, we're interested in measuring more effectively, which is ironic because that's our, our whole thing is to measure impact, but. Just out of curiosity, I was I was just wondering if you've had any like I don't know thinking about like studying air studying different projects. Um, I guess I don't know. I guess 
and thinking about it being like some of these different tools as like more citizen science tools. I was curious, I don't, I don't know, I guess something I grapple with is thinking about like being in academia and coming in studying a place. Um, have you had any like negative experiences where like people are like, why are you um, putting this metric on this thing in my neighborhood or anything like that? Do you mean like the, the community or the client? Yeah, really well I guess, to, to yeah, people like people in the community, not necessarily the client, but just like people, or I guess, yeah, like, I guess as like an academic institution, have you had any like pushback or like um, any any sort of like criticisms, I, I, I guess is my question. Yeah, anything like that, I would, I would really hear of secondhand because most of it is, you know, the team's out on the ground with people. Um, I think really, and this I think relates to one of your other questions, I think that would just be the self-selection of who participates in these types of evaluations, right? If someone's not into it, they're, they're not going to participate. Um, but I haven't, I feel like I'm not remembering, but there, there was an example at some point where the client, I don't even remember, but there was a client who was very reticent and, you know, some, some clients in, in addition firms can be very protective of what is said about their work. And so evaluation can be very scary. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what we do about that is really to, number one, in, as part of the application process, making sure that there's an openness. And honestly, we're familiar with many of those who, who apply. And so we, we can put our best faith in them that they will be open and, and honest. And that, that's on the firm side. The client side or the community side, we have no idea, right, how, how they might react to, to this program. Um, it's just impossible to, to know ahead of time. But overall, we found that for the most part, firms are wonderful. I mean, we've had one or two case studies, I won't name which ones, where a thousand people had to read it and approve every single thing said because the narrative surrounding that project was so sort of sacred to them and, and mm -hmm. important. And again, that's understandable as well. But what obviously, as you can see, what we're trying to do here is get into that evaluation. And yes, um, you know, I often answer questions about how our benefits are all positive, right? They're all positive things. They're all, you know, the power of landscape, which is great. And I think it's important that we've done that. But if you really dive into those methods documents and read into them, you will see more of that sort of here's where things didn't quite come out as we expected. Here's, here's where um, we found that we fell short. Uh, and that information arguably is much more valuable to the firms, um, but we still we still make it available, but we might not trumpet it out out of respect for for those participating. So it's kind of that might not that's not exactly your question, but um, it's a huge kind of area that we it's a tension we have to balance in in what we do. Thank you. Yeah, Megan, what you just said reminded me of a couple of clauses and paragraphs in the Liberty Bank building um case study which which we read but another question on that later we're going to stay on methodology so i'll switch the slides so we facing some emerging societal challenges COVID 19 gentrification they've disrupted the utility of traditional metrics to measure landscape performance like visual surveys of site usage uh how many people attend events and increases in property values surrounding landscape projects so because of these challenges, do you anticipate any gaps in quantifying social and economic benefits of a site? How can we account for these challenges when measuring the performance of land? Yeah, for, for COVID, I don't think I can even speak to that just because it's such an anomaly. You know, if you want to study a, a, co a study a project during sort of the thick of, of the COVID pandemic, you have to be your comparison has to be COVID or not COVID. It's not pre-project and post-project like most of our comparisons are, right? Um, so that has definitely affected us with the program. We've, we've done our best, but we, we do have a couple of years, especially 2020, where there's just a lot of limitations, unfortunately, to, to our evaluation. And Liberty Bank Building was definitely a, a victim of that. Um, but I can definitely speak to sort of gentrification or at least the the different lenses we're using to look at our landscapes, our evolving understanding of what is a benefit for who and, and you know, really caring how that how that plays out. So kind of, I mean, I, I sort of cringe now at this point, every time I in our presentation, you know, I'm talking about increased surrounding property value, that can be really great. Often those benefits are going to a developer, 
maybe it's a great developer who invests in their community and it's a great thing for everybody, including the neighbors. It, it's possible, but it's of course also can be a, a negative impact. Um, and just the dynamics of gentrification being not particularly well understood, um, but there's too much more to understand about them for us to kind of draw conclusions. Um, so it, we've been struggling with that. Um, surveys also like like you say here kind of event event attendance numbers or surveys yeah visual surveys of site users surveys of you know talking to people who are using the site obviously that that's always been a limitation right you're you're not catching who who is not there you're not hearing from who who isn't there you're not hearing why they're not there um so i'd love some sort of inside out framework that we could consider to capture that but it's just not something that that has been able to, to capture um it's definitely, especially the economic benefits, it's, it's something that right now we're at the point of reevaluating. Um, so I'd love to hear from all of you if you have any thoughts about that, um, but it's something we're working on. And our performance benefits really, the aim, you know, our CEO is, was, was in marketing before she came to LAF and she really understood the importance of landscape architects having a marketing statement, having a value add statement, and it's essential and it's done so much for the profession. And so that's why we have these really concise benefits. They're, they're really concise. They don't include all the little wrinkles and exceptions and, and nuances that are that exist in a lot of these, uh, these systems that we're looking at. Um, there's always sort of more to the story. So I would say, you know, if, if you're measuring a, the performance of a landscape and you find that your benefit may not really be a benefit, it's time to really step back and sort of reevaluate. Um, because those challenges that you've listed can 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 break them right and you you might need to just stand in a different position. Uh, you know and evaluate from a different perspective, which could be community perspective could be. Um, you know any or evaluate compare a different time compare pre and post COVID, right instead or, or whatever, um, but there's just a lot of nuance there. yeah I have kind of a, a follow up question to that. Um, in thinking about these case studies it's uh, sometimes being about a certain amount of time, um, like the Liberty Bank building, you know, it was very influenced by these specific number of years where they were measuring, um, you know, users of the site and it sort of ended right when COVID started. Um, and then that all informed, you know, the completion of this case study. How common is it for um, firms or practitioners to continue to, to monitor these sites and, and do sort of post occupancy studies and research after the case study period has ended. Is that is there a resource for that within the performance series, or is that common, or is it usually just they do it and then it's done? It's an excellent question. Uh, I will say, you know, I know of a few because they communicate with us, um, but I would say it's only a handful. I mean, basically the ones that come into the program with a lot of data that they've already measured, those will typically continue to do it. Those who come in with not very much, or maybe they did site certification, you know, and that was it, they are less likely to. Um, we don't provide any specific resources other than just, you know, the landscape performance series. Um, we hope though that what the program does is set up relationships between the faculty and the students so that those relationships can grow as far as potential future projects to evaluate either that same project or, or other projects. Um, and I think this relates maybe to, to your next question, but um, setting up long term performance evaluation. I don't I, I think CSI is not strong enough to actually set someone up for that for life. I think it has to come from the beginning in the conception of the project, um, whereas the CSI if they're not doing it already, it's sort of more of a snapshot in time. That's what we call all of our case studies. It's it's unfortunate, but they can't be more than a snapshot in time. Um, sometimes I get requests to update case studies, and we typically don't do it because we'd have to update the whole case study. You know, you have to go completely back and and you know do it all over again unless they have really great monitoring in place, which most sites most sites don't. Um, but then stepping back with that question and just in general, how many firms are doing ongoing monitoring after their sort of contract has ended or if they've built in a contract for monitoring for longer. Increasingly common, which is great. Um, 
I think that my lens is a little bit biased because those that are doing it come to us and, you know, they're, they're primarily the, the leading firms, you know, usually it's leading firms that have the resources to maybe uh, have a research lab like Olin or, uh, you know, Sasaki or, you know, these firms that really can, can take this on. Um, that being said, some of the smaller firms are awesome at this as well and can kind of do it in a more sort of scrappy way. Um, one of my favorite case studies is Chester Arthur Schoolyard because it wasn't, it didn't, they didn't participate in CSI. It's a small firm and they just sent two of their associates out for a few days to collect some data on uh, energy levels of the kids. And it was a very clear before and after green schoolyard project. And so they could evaluate activity levels and you know community site usage, not just of the kids. That was a big goal. I think you probably saw it in the most likely in the in the presentation you watched, but that, that's one of my favorites because they just used the performance series and just did it. And, and they didn't need this huge structure of a lab to make it happen. Um, but that that monitoring, you know, is as I understand it was was ongoing, you know, for several years after the project, which is pretty great. Yeah, that's really insightful. Thank you. So I'll trans I will transition to the question that we have for you about partnerships. <clears throat> and um and perhaps we can think a little bit more um along the lines of what you're describing about this being possible at, at small firms and at large firms too. Uh, designers across disciplines often are thinking about design as a vehicle for environmental and social change, but their clients may be less familiar with this perspective. So how might we as designers make the case for measuring performance as part of the design process and build those partnerships that foster ongoing performance monitoring? It's a great question and kind of what we devoted you know these these 11 or so years to um one is if you have the luxury to do so which right now we're in a little bit of a boom and our firms can be a little more choosy but choose your clients carefully right i mean not not everyone can do that but choose who you're going to work with and if your client is really a, a meaningful part of the goal setting for this project, the visioning, the, the deciding what it's really going to be. Um, and then, you know, they hire you for your type of vision instead of just because you'll get it done. Um, you'll find obviously that buy-in to evaluate the ultimate result is going to be much stronger. So, you know, with this question, you sort of point to that disconnect between what the client is thinking and what the designer is thinking. So if you're not aligned in that thinking with your clients, then any of the goals that might come out of that partnership won't have really been agreed on entirely. Um, and so therefore it won't make much sense to measure against those goals. Um, performance really, of course, you know, it, it, to some extent, it has to be measured to some, you know, to, to what the client wanted, that has to be part of it. Uh, although of course you bring your own design vision. So it, your it, it's pretty essential. I mean, some clients you're not going to bring along for the ride and you're gonna have to integrate, you know, any of these, you're, you're gonna sort of have to be a secret vehicle for environmental and social change and try to make it happen on your end, but you might not be able to count on them as far as helping you measure your impact for, for the performance piece of it. Um, certain types of clients are definitely more amenable to a landscape performance sort of approach integration in the, whole process and, and the, the project than others. So, you know, more obviously more socially or socially focused clients, environmentally responsible clients, but also um, tech clients, which may not fit in the other categories, but they uh, tend to have a better understanding of, you know, metrics and, and data gathering. Um, so I've, I've, you know, heard from firms that they've had a lot of success working with you know, tech company campus projects, you know, things like that, as far as um, talking about even things like installing sensors or um, evaluating employee reactions to a new a new landscape element or, or things like that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. I mean, I think it just, there's no way to do it unless it's truly aligned with what the client is trying to achieve. And so, um, yeah.
I want to make space for any. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Megan. No, I just, I would, I would also add just building the partnerships that foster performance monitoring. The strongest trend right now that I see are partnerships with academia. It's just, just developing those bridges with faculty who, although, you know, universities aren't overflowing with, with funding all the time, as you'll hear from probably your professors, um, they do have different sources of funding and different ways to, to make specific performance evaluations uh, happen. So that, that's honestly one of the most important partnerships that I, I recommend to designers to, uh, to make these things happen if they don't have the resources or the knowledge to, to do it in-house. Thank you for elucidating on that point. Um, so I will move on to the final question, which is regarding policy. So the Liberty Bank building case study really showed us that calculations and modeling different design options could really lead to a more open and welcoming design. However, designers still were faced with challengers, challenges around land use and zoning for that project. We were curious to know how can landscape performance series case studies effectively influence policies, including those regarding land use and zoning. Can landscape performance series case studies influence policies about social concerns like equity, environmental justice, and sustainability? I love this question. I think I would maybe respectfully adjust it slightly to say, you know, how can designers influence policies? Because I think our case studies only go so far um, it's the de designers themselves that really take on those literal battles um, of, of with uh, you know local role makers typically um, and ultimately change them. So there are a lot of examples in the LPS um, of designers doing that. Unfortunately, we don't have like a special section for that, but it certainly comes out in a few case studies that I could I could name. Um, and in the cases where designers are effective in influencing policies, uh, especially land use and zoning. Um, they're, they're overwhelmingly designers who are local to the area and have done multiple projects in the area, right? Um, they're the ones that are in the best position. They have a relationship with the city, many times years long relationships with, with the city. They can use that to, to affect code. And so taking that another step, I mean, this, this is, this isn't, accessible to everyone, but you know, a massive way that designers can take kind of the next step there is to get involved with their local zoning boards, get involved in kind of the city planning world um, on a volunteer basis, maybe as much as you can, run for city council, you know, all that type of stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say our case studies, they can definitely support that, that effort, but it's really the locally embedded designers who have the patience above all to sort of slog through meetings, you know, the ones that will show up and will continue to be a giant pest to their local regulators until their project, you know, earns whatever policy change they need or whatever exception that, that sets a precedent uh, is that they're kind of seeking. So, um, the examples that we have of these are mostly kind of, you know, they're, they're top tier firms who have these, these relationships, but when you create a space that maybe takes a risk. So let's say, um, this is kind of a dramatic example, but Salesforce Park, a PWP project uh, on top of the transit center in San Francisco, beautiful project, uh, very noticeable, uh, massive green roof on top of this transit center, but they basically built a wetland um, on that roof that can't be used per regulation. And they were working that out with the city throughout. I believe it still might not be quite uh, in service um, because it was supposed to recycle gray water, I believe, to the building. But um, that sort of was an example that they built it. They just built it anyway. And the project is so impactful and it's obviously, you know, getting so much attention and use and publicity that I think that that in turn affects those decisions to, to allow, allow things to happen. Um, so sort of letting, it's sort of the asking for forgiveness rather than permission <laughs> approach in a way, but it's more that you understand that one piece of your design might not quite function as, as needed until you get you know, you, you show what you're trying to do and then it's garnered the public support or the, the approval that, that you need, uh, the pressure to 
to loosen some regulations. Um, yeah, another example is composting toilets. You know, some places don't allow them. Um, and it can really just be that education piece and educating the right people um, to, to get that through, but mostly it's about patience. Um, so yeah, I think we can always train our designers to be better advocates. It's a lot of the work that we're doing with the Super Studio. Um, hopefully our upcoming sort of summit and events will we'll touch on that as well, but it's just more about becoming savvy in those worlds. Uh, the earlier, the better, you know, when you're a student as opposed to when you are tossed into a firm and, you know, sent to your first sort of meeting with local stakeholders that, where you're asking for a, you know, a change in code and, and they don't know you, right? Um, so it's, it's learning how to navigate the systems early and then being with a firm that's hopefully truly embedded in the, in the community, in the space. Yeah, it's a tough question. I hope we can answer, the, answer that more in the next few years. I guess on kind of like a follow up to, to, to that question, um, I guess I'm just thinking like on the flip side of it, like it's kind of scary to think about, like, I feel like there's so many designers who don't really uh, take into account, like maybe design more for profit as opposed to some of the things that y'all are interested in. I guess I'm just wondering like, what sort of interactions do you have with those like big, maybe um, more profit driven designers? Um, and if there's like a way to like infiltrate those firms in a way that like makes them think about like metrics and things that are uh, would potentially cause less harm. I would say some of the more you know profit driven firms are absolutely interested in metrics and economic benefit and things like that. Um, it's it's very complicated, right? Because we are bound by this relationship, this client, you know, designer relationship. And so, you know, it's not, it can never be as simple as saying, you know, the good firms are the bad firms. Um, some of these really giant firms have some amazing, very socially progressive work or really great climate sustainability work, but they, they also need to make money to be able to do that work, unfortunately. And so there is that other side of it. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of shy away, I guess, from making those distinctions and try to take them as they are sort of by project. Um, and, and you hope that when the firms sort of get involved in doing this with one project, that it sort of influences beyond. And the, the specific designers, the principals, whoever was directly involved in that project, that they, by evaluating their work, take it into their future projects um, and, and hopefully start to affect the culture of their firm. And I think that's happened in a lot of places where it's sort of spread, right? And they've been able to integrate this in more, in more places. Um, but it's tough because a lot, of, a lot of performance evaluation still is subsidized by doing, you know, more, maybe less, less sustainable, less uh, even just less exciting uh, projects. Um, it, it, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. Do you feel like metrics can be like co-opted to be like used as like justifications sometimes by like maybe firms, like they'll be like, oh, like, but then like, I don't know, I guess like the authenticity of the metrics is like really important. Like, do you see people like, like trying to skew that and like use metrics in a way to like justify a certain type of development that maybe isn't necessarily thoughtful? I've not seen, I mean, in, in, from our perspective, I've not seen our, our information used that way, especially since, you know, they're put out there kind of in this format that we have put together. Um, so not really, but I could certainly see that. Yeah. Kind of the inverse of that going to, um, back to the conversation a little bit about negative results or insignificant results. Publication bias is really um, a big concern in research. And, um, but I'm, so it's good to hear that there are negative results showing up in um, LAF case studies, but would it ever get to a point where it could create like liability concerns or any issues between designer and client and community to hear those kinds of um, results. Yeah, and that's probably you know part of the reason that that um, 
some firms have will never apply for this program right or, or have hesitancies or you know require very thorough reviews um, that's only happened a few times but um it, yeah I, th I think um sorry i lost my i lost my thought i had related that but um it it can be tricky i don't i don't know um we have a lot of uh Sorry, I'm trying to capture my last thought, <laughs> thought that went went away. Um, negative results. Yeah, I think with with the LPS, we have sort of this. I call it the different tensions of LPS of the LPS and, and the case studies. And you know, publication bias is huge. The the challenge with it for us, as far as what we would consider to be an unpublishable case study. So if, if a project goes all the way through, our researchers look at it, our, our firms get their information, and they either come up with no performance benefits because you know they couldn't evaluate them, um, or just the methodologies are too weak and, and you know indefensible. They're not making an a compelling argument. It's interesting because it's that doesn't mean the site isn't doing doing whatever they're hoping it's doing it, it that's not what it means you know often it is inconclusive um or there are just too many darn limitations to 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 evaluation so yeah it, it's kind of this weird sense of um you're evaluating a project but usually if you have a failure to have results or have anything positive to say about the project, it's more likely because of a weakness in your methodology or because of something about a limitation of the status of the project. You know, it could be a year of COVID, it could be, be all these different things. And so it can never really be as cut and dry as, you know, oh, this project just isn't working. You know, it just didn't meet any of its goals. So it's, it's this very tricky thing um, in talking about maintaining that rigor. Um, and the rigor, you know, we often we have to take the perspective that as long as you are very clear about your limitations, um, we can we can work with it typically because we're not what we do with the LPS is not, you know, it's a quick evaluation. Obviously, a seven year longitudinal study would be much more defensible to, to evaluate a lot of these things, but, but that's not what we do. And that's not going to work for the discipline. The discipline will never have that time and that funding. And so we're looking at things that are defensible, but they're not necessarily the, the best available science, right? So in that sense, um, it almost every case study is almost more of a perspective on a project than the truth about the project, you know, the objective truth, right? So it's sort of negotiating that and constructing that narrative. And it's different, obviously, for every project. So before we hand the floor back over to Kofi, uh, I want to make space for any students who might want to ask a question of Megan related to our questions or anything else while it's with us. suggestions for me always happy for those or you can email them if you would prefer drop my email in the chat as well all right speak now if you ever hold your peace people she's she's a busy person until april for sure <laughs> yeah we're all hustling until april yeah we're all on the, on the run i have a non-related to um case studies question um, so what might, uh, I'd be really interested to attend the Green New Deal, um, summit. What might someone who did not get to participate in a Green New Deal super studio, uh, gain from the experience as you all are conceptualizing it? Ooh, it's still being a little bit ironed out, but I think I know enough to answer that at this point. Um, it's going to be very connected to the super studio, but it, it, it won't be some sort of, you know, the, the super studio isn't some primer that you need to, to know about to attend. Um, our panelists and speakers, and I'm crossing my fingers here, are 
top tier, they are people who you absolutely want to hear from. So for me, that's a huge draw. Um, I'm biased because I'm, I'm in charge of the panelists and the speakers, but it's, it's we're going to finally, I think, finally sort of really reckon with this connection of policy and advocacy and design and, and just that kind of awkward place where they meet. Um, so as far as just being an impactful designer, and I think hearing from those who negotiate that space all the time um, is going to be really valuable, whether or not you've looked at the Super Studio projects or are aware of them, their presence will sort of be there. We will have a, a hopefully an exhibition piece where you can see some of them while you're there um, in, in large format. But um, yeah, it, it, it's we had, uh, I don't, this is this is not totally confirmed, but basically we have two different panels. One's going to focus on advocacy and one on implementation. So it's talking both about that aspirational piece as well as the the really on the ground piece. Um, so yeah, I think I, I wish I could. I don't have my sort of spiel down yet because again, it's still in development. But I think it will it will be quite a quite an event. Um, it's the National Building Museum. Um, the other piece of that is that we're really excited to bring in non-landscape architects you know with, with the national building museum you have a, a massive potential audience who aren't just designers so really grounding the role of designers in in of the built environment in general uh in this space of jobs justice and decarbonization not just the green new deal but just when you're talking about kind of those those themes that it brings up um yeah we should have some electeds there hopefully and uh it'll, it'll be really cool yeah Fantastic, thanks. Yeah, as soon as the details get out, we'll spread the word. We'd love for everybody to make a way to DC and participate, it should be great. All right, last call. Feel free to email me as well. Megan, I'd like to thank you. Of course, thanks thank so much you for all. spending time with us. Uh, great answers to questions. Um, I'm sure there'll be more as we dig in, uh, and uh, I'll let you know where it goes. You know, maybe maybe if you'd like to, you could come back and hear where they are. Their challenge, your capstone for the semester, is to propose a strategy for evaluating uh, equitable and just impacts of an open space of their choice. So they don't have to evaluate it, but they have to start to design a strategy for how they might. So love that. Yeah, I would love yeah. some follow up on that. Working on that as well. So that'd be great. Sounds good. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. Man. All right, folks. Ready to come back? Okay. Any other thoughts or reflections? based on that conversation with Megan. It is interesting that they're also looking at this issue now, uh, how to uh, address these issues and how we measure things. Um, when Megan was talking about um, who or what typology submits to these uh, case studies, she talked about how they all kind of have a sustainability aspect to them. And it just kind of made me think about what if this sort of framework was integrated into like other um, projects that may not have that in their design, like forefront, what if we brought like this critical eye to projects that um, aren't sustainable or like don't have like that as their um, goal in mind, um, I feel like that could possibly like lead to change because if we see what's not working, we can hopefully change that. So okay. a little bit of public shaming. I know they have the ugly building challenge as opposed to shame uh, contemporary architects into uh, easing back. I don't know if it's had any impact. You know, they have it in Raleigh and the ugliest building every year is the center of architecture right on uh, Peace Street that was done by uh, uh, the great Frank Harmon. It always wins. It hasn't had any effect. 
But, you know, what's interesting is uh, there are, you know, she talked about uh, organizations who, you know, use the metric not necessarily to submit a case study, but as a bit of evidence to pursue a grant or to do other things. I could definitely see it as an advocacy tool. Um, you know, a real situation that's happening in real time right now in Raleigh is downtown South, uh, which is a, you know, billion dollar, multi-billion dollar development uh, in King Properties, who, uh, if you're familiar with North Hills, it's the same company that did that. Uh, and Kane basically extorting the city into allowing them to, to build there by saying, you know, if you don't approve our plan, you know, we're not going to pay attention to any kind of environmental protections and to heck with any kind of equity stuff. So the city kind of panicked, you know, the planning commission voted against, you know, approving downtown stuff. They thought they hadn't done authentic community engagement even during COVID, uh, but the city council approved it. So, um, but I think that, you know, one of the groups that we're gonna learn more about in the class, Partners for Environmental Justice, uh, has built sort of this broader coalition uh, along Walnut Creek uh, to try and advocate. So, you know, being able to do like quick estimates of the impacts, uh, it's hard because um, in the site planning process, uh, there's no mechanism that requires a developer uh, to share their plan until they get to site plan with you. So when you think about projects, if you haven't done this before, uh, most developers aren't using their own money. So they're borrowing money. So they have a return that they have to promise to their investors. And most of them, it's an excuse for them to be what we call risk averse, which is to say, take a copy of something that no works somewhere else to remove the risk uh, and then uh, duplicate it to easier investors, and then you sort of tweak it and modify it based on local context. So by the time you see a site plan for something as big as downtown South, they've been working on it for like three or four years. You know, so there are all these early stages when those kinds of questions maybe it's bringing up would be really useful, you know, um, to, you know, challenge how they're handling resources, people, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, by the time it gets to site plan level, you know, it's about, 40 to 50 percent cooked so it takes uh public pressure you know and an advocacy to do that who was really good at that uh was a retired mayor of charleston uh mayor riley um he was very well versed in design and planning and architecture and landscape architecture and he there was a lot of stuff that could have gone sideways in charleston that he personally was the advocate to kind of tip it the other way. And there's an increasing number of public officials who are savvy enough or aware enough um, uh, who, uh, who can kind of intervene when the time is right. But uh, it's getting difficult. Brian said literally strategically with hope. Yep, that too. That too, that's real. But, but I like the idea of using it as an advocacy tool as another you know, weapon you know, that you can use in the battle. It's a good comment. Anybody else? I was just gonna say, I think it's really interesting to think about like metrics in general. And like, I feel like, I don't know, like I feel like in our like capitalist society, met, like success is usually like the metric for success is like growth and like profit. Yeah. So I guess it's really kind of like, to me, like really inspiring to think about coming up with this metrics that value other things rather than yeah. that. So I feel like, this yeah. work is like really important and like, I don't know, I feel like, yeah, I guess like thinking about how to come up with thoughtful ways of measuring things seems like really important to me. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think, you know, been in some interesting conversations. I got to give a talk virtually next week at uh, NYU about uh, land trusts and cooperatives and that kind of stuff. So what's interesting about it is I've been in a couple of these situations. I'm pretty moderate. So usually people on the panel are like, you know, you need to abolish property, you know, and it's just sort of like, good luck with that, you know, good luck with that. But, you know, it's true that a lot of our notion of change is being co-opted by a neoliberal understanding of how change is made. So which is to say you have to pay your way, right? So if you deal with like pre-colonial, communities and societies, pre-industrial communities, you know, the economic value uh, of 
the pro productivity of the landscape just is not a thing, right? It's usually spiritual, it's traditional, it's tied to ritual. Um, you know, they're, they're deeper, longer term relationships, you know, seven generations, like that whole thing. So, you no, know, this colonial, settler colonial enterprise, which started to introduce property as uh, a good like that can be bought, sold, exchanged, and defended. You know, it enabled things that help us, right? So, you know, um, the uh, technology required to uh, uh, assess landscapes are all tied to uh, notions of, of private property, right? So, you know, there are some offshoots to that that are beneficial, but the flip side is that um, uh, we don't have the equal number of public controls anymore uh, to do that. And a lot of it has to do with, at least in the United States, the US context, we have divested through lowering taxes uh, from the sufficient amount of public uh, revenue required uh, to provide just a lot of social goods. So you know, a trend that started in the 80s and is in our face now, which is to say, you know, you compare other communities you know, around the world where you know, they have a very strong social system and uh, safety net, uh, you don't see like these neoliberal practices where you know just kind of no, you know, having access to a healthy uh, environment, clean water, clean that, that's a social good. We're just going to do what we got to do to make that happen. Um, it's in our context where when you lose that private sphere, you see you find themselves in a tough position where they're like, well, we know all this is going to cost a lot of money. If we don't raise capital to pay for it, then, you know, we can't. All we're going to do is break all these promises we got. So it, it flipped their mindset. Like how do we replace that lost public revenue uh, with private return on investment? And so we're kind of like in the throes of it now, you know, which is um, the power balance is inverted. Um, but I think that data works on both sides because everybody uses the same data and it's a matter of um, putting in that position. So that's a good point. Any other comments before we move on? I guess. Right, well, yeah, go ahead. One, one thought. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, one thought that was coming to mind as Megan made the comparison between landscape architects and doctors was what level of validity or certainty we, our different professions, have about their the impacts of a design of a product of a medicine on their user. Mm. I think a structural engineer, for example, has to present a number of calculations that their bridge will stand up if it's spanning a river. Right. Um, it's surprising to me that landscape architecture, well, I guess it's not all that surprising when you consider the context of what landscape architecture has been for the last uh, four plus years. But um, I've, I guess I'd prefer a situation where I had to justify my my landscape's impact based on metrics that were required of me to show. I think that would, I've, I've seen far too often that a lot of landscape architecture is, you must adhere to minimum public requirement, nothing more, mm -hmm. nothing less. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. So bar is too low for you, huh? Let's raise the bar. Raise the bar, baby, raise the bar. You know, what's interesting is with the universal uh, design, that's probably the one territory um, that has had a tremendous amount of impact, uh, like pervasive. Uh, even when I was in school, uh, when I took grading and drainage, our instructor was in a wheelchair. He had, he had a MS, uh, sadly has since passed away. But he had motorized wheelchair. So there were two things that were funny. One was you could hear his chair coming. So when there was a deadline or a due date, you know, and it was like five minutes to go, you hear him like wheeling up the hallway and go, oh, panic, you know, drawing as fast as he can before he got there. Uh, but the other thing he did was that he would bring a, a regular manual wheelchair with him. And when we did site visits, he'd lead these site visits in his motorized wheelchair and we had to rotate in the wheelchair. So every couple of minutes, somebody else had to go sit in that thing. So for the landscape architects, if you want to know the difference between 5% and 6% and 7%, get in a wheelchair. You know, figure it out. So he's like got, you know, a uh, turbocharger and whatever on his chair. He can do like 30 miles an hour. So he's gone. Everybody else is walking away and you're like, wait, 
We catch up for me, right? So there were these internalized lessons that we can relate to. I think in a lot of cases, and we did talk about this in the uh, Super Studio Task Force, was that um, something like climate change, like to be able to say that you're going to be able to do things now uh, for an uncertain future is almost impossible to verify. Uh, the state of flux that's happening and our understanding of climate science has thrown just a lot of things we take as assumptions just out the window. You know? So um, what's been happening has been uh, not relying on the historical record, for example, as a predictor of what's gonna happen in the future. So an example of this, like that systematizing these FEMA floodplain maps, none of them are accurate anymore, none. So there's due diligence of like, oh, you need to keep something out of a hundred year floodplain to keep it away from flood. I mean, I've lived through three 500 year floods since I've been in North Carolina, right? So the ability to rely on these uh, past systems is less reliable. And so what people are doing are trying to build these really sophisticated models. And then when they get a new data point, they add to it to try and perfect it. So there's this like baked in flux and uncertainty in certain landscape systems that make that certainty, I'm not gonna say impossible, but I'll say improbable. Uh, but there are others that are more reliable. So something like, you know, universal design and, and other tools that, you know, you just gotta do that. So I think it's how you scope it. I think for the whole scope of what we know as landscape architecture, probably not, but based on the blinders you put on it, the boundaries you place on it, you probably could. You probably could. It just takes some time. Yeah. Yeah. So, sidebar for the non-landscape architects, and sorry for all that stuff. Uh, the, the wheelchair thing is true, though. So I think that you know, if you have not internalized why well, we got to make things accessible to people with different levels of mobility, just pass in a wheelchair. And, you know, we don't have to say nothing. You'll we'll, we'll figure it out in a second. All right. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen. Should we get one for the LAP department? Evan, yes. Yes, yes, we should. Oh, I'm not gonna show you my dirty screen. What am I doing? I'm messing up, I need my clean screen. There we go. That's the one I want. All right, the clean screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes. All right, so there are a couple of notes in the chat so i would like for you all to uh, take on uh, a survey uh, bonus points if you know this song mm, yeah no bonuses today oh there's a note in the chat a couple notes in the chat ah somebody knows nice close lauren close not quite not quite it's a true one hit wonder but has one of the coolest videos of all time. There you go, Michaela. You got it. You got it. Michaela gets a gold star today. Michaela and Brian. So in this link, there's a survey. Uh, the goal is to uh, have you all individually fill these out. And it'll be our attempt. Yeah, the video is good. Uh, attempt is to uh, start to just a first stab. I know nobody's really done a deep dive on it, but just based on what you know right now, where you see yourself. So it's gonna ask you questions about, you know, what you're really interested in looking at through your investigation. Um, you know, you're leaning more towards environmental justice, leaning more towards social equity and mix between the two. Are there sub themes that you're interested in? For example, health or economics or politics. Um, is there a type of open space that you're considering? Um, and, and, you know, those sorts of broad questions. And if this experiment works, we'll use it as a way, the way time is going, probably not gonna work. But uh, to sort you all out into groups to have these conversations, just peer to peer conversations. So that people who have a similar set of uh, interests right now before we've committed to what we're gonna do, um, that you are able to have just a cohort, just a group of people you can talk to in addition to the rest of the class. So the breakout thing may not happen, uh, today because of uh, time, uh, great conversation, but I don't want to hold you all night, but you know, the, you know, there'll be, a, there's a link at the bottom that deals with the Google doc, you know, who you are, uh, what you're considering right now. So, so you don't do that yet. Just do the survey. 
right? If you want to do the survey while I'm talking, that's okay too. I can't tell most of you I got your screens off in there. Uh, but uh, the survey will help me to get a sense of where people are. And if you don't know yet, that's okay too. Uh, we've still got a little bit of time to figure that out. That's the way to get that started. Uh, one thing that I've been grappling with, some people ask me about this question, like how would you measure it? You know, what are the things that you're looking for? I'm, I'm informed a bit by literature and resilience on social bonds and social cohesion. So this idea came out of the aftermath, the superstorm Sandy, which hit the Northeast, you know, a decade ago, did incredible damage. There was a differentiation in how different communities recovered from the storm. There were a lot of factors that this model ignores. So, you know, uh, race, income, that kind of stuff, they didn't get into it. But what they did figure out uh, that was interesting were the communities that had strong social cohesion, where people kind of knew their neighbors, um, where you had social ties that were directly tied to your place geographically, uh, tended to recover a bit faster. And the three subcomponents in this particular model in play uh, is social mobility, right? So the potential to pass uh, wealth and opportunity on to the next generation, which is sort of a uh, surrogate for, for income and education level. Uh, social capital, levels of trust and civic participation, hmm. how active people are in their communities and how much trust they have amongst one another. And levels of social exclusion, you know, uh, we heard a bit about that with social vulnerability, um, you know, previous reading, uh, Dr. Dr. Martin's work, that uh, social exclusion, right? Uh, excluded communities tend to be uh, more vulnerable, but that sense of inclusion. So, you know, I haven't figured it out yet, but I think there's something to that. Uh, so that's sort of a sidebar, but sort of a way that I've been thinking about framing it. I'm not the only one who's been trying to think about it. So this is a great time to examine some models that you may not even have read about or heard about. So enterprise community partners, really interesting organization. Uh, they try and build capacity in communities uh, through designers, right? So they provide all these resources for long-term sort of embedded in community relationships with designers to solve uh, sort of complex community problems. And this was their attempt at talking about components of community resilience. And so often when we talk about resilience, it's sort of Echoing what uh, Dr. Martin has talked about, we think about the hard infrastructure, but not the social ones, right? So the roles that culture plays and participation and shared activities and a uh, sense of healing because there's an incredible amount of trauma tied to it. So it opens up the world to a different vocabulary and ways of measures. They have not been very prescriptive with the measures, not as hardcore as what we heard from Megan, but it has inspired them to invest in things we normally don't, right? So arts and culture is a key component to resilience, right? So uh, festivals, music, art, you know, as things that are more accessible to people in some cases than, than some of the more intensive infrastructure that we associate with community resilience. Uh, a few years ago, I had a chance to spend some time with Brian Lee and the uh, Designers Protest Design Justice Crew in New Orleans. Uh, so we, we had like a two day summit. And as a part of that, we went on a walk uh, through some areas that had recovered since Hurricane Katrina. And this is Aretha Castle Haley Boulevard, uh, which was completely wiped out after Hurricane Katrina. And since it, since that time has gone through this very slow rebuild. And we met with the Gulf Coast Housing Partnership, a very interesting organization. It's essentially a bank that invests in housing and their goal is increased property values. And that's what they say explicitly, but implicitly they have this whole other return on investment model. That's fascinating. So this is a cultural center that we were all touring when we were walking around. Um, you know, they started to keep track of uh, rates of vacancy and blight in this corridor. So these baseline measurements of, you know, what places were occupied, what weren't, and over time, how did it change? Police calls. Now this is before the national attention on over-policing and uh, sort of the injustice in the criminal justice system, but uh, reduced police calls as an indicator of increased community stability. That's interesting. Um, population growth, we would all sort of assume. Purchasing power, that's interesting. 
because that's a metric that speaks directly to uh, retail developers. So if you're trying to attract businesses, you know, being able to communicate the community's uh, purchasing power is an indicator uh, that's important. Uh, voting and voting uh, and levels of registration uh, comparatively. So looking at it compared overall to the city of New Orleans, much higher, you know, rate of registration and actual participation and that as an indicator of sort of civic responsibility. So they started to develop all these other kind of personal matrix. What's interesting about this place is that there was no displacement. So admittedly, uh, a portion of it was vacant, but there were residents there um, that they were able to achieve, you know, a lot of uh, community investment slow and iteratively in creative ways without displacing people. So this notion of gentrification and displacement, which we'll come back to several times in the class, aren't always the same. Uh, so, you know, that was interesting. And this is sort of their in-house sort of pet model, you know. Uh, for the people who saw the lecture last night, uh, this is Sierra Bainbridge, uh, one of the co-founders of Mass Design Group. And for the people who participated in the, uh, the Duda uh, competition, she was here to kind of close that loop. Um, uh, but, you know, what's interesting about what she presented to me is she did address the, the, the memorial uh, sort of uh, event that you all participated in. But she spent more time talking about how mass measures impact their model. So they have the uh, integrated design methodology, or IDM, which leads with mission, right? So they do the, all of this work to sort of define a clear set of objectives internally and in-house. Then they develop methods that they think are attached to that particular mission. Then they think about impact. So we're going clockwise around this wheel. Uh, and then they think more broadly, like how can things that we're doing at the project scale impact broader systems? You know, so, so that's their internal kind of check uh, in terms of uh, measuring the impacts of what they do. The purpose-built toolkit, which is there, uh, is you can free download it online, but you know, it's, it's a really fascinating uh, model related to us. And you know, I was glad because she featured one of the projects I really like, Mass, which is their uh, One Health campus in Rwanda, uh, where they're trying to um, demonstrate uh, healthy practices and integrating human health, animal health, ecological health, all at the same time, right? So that the agriculture is not going away. We need to be able to produce food for an increasing population, but we don't have to do that at the expense of our, our non-human uh, neighbors. And so, um, you know, their master plan, I think is interesting. Uh, there's a lot in the plan that you can't see in the graphic, you know, namely how they designed this project to create uh, sort of a distribution and a resource chain uh, to prioritize local resources. So either things that are removed for construction on the site, you know, they were removing individual plants and creating nurseries on site, transplanting them on site, to then bring them back after uh, construction occurred. Uh, I think 90% of the materials they sourced for the construction of this are within a few hundred miles of the site and 98% uh, of the labor. So the people working on it are actually local people as well. So this ability to leverage a design project to activate these other systems that we know matter, and that's sort of in progress, uh, some of the work that they're doing. So uh, just really fascinating thing. And when it comes online, for the people who didn't see it, uh, we'll share a link, it was, it was a great lecture. Uh, Eco Districts was mentioned um, in some of the readings, uh, which started in Portland. Uh, and I uh, was really trying to think at a certain scale of place, so at the district scale, so it's not the whole city, you know, it's not one place, but, you know, what we might call a neighborhood. Uh, and what are all the things that we need to think about with regards to balancing issues of climate and equity and resilience? A lot of their work um, is focused on, uh, we were talking about policy before, uh, policy frameworks. So a lot of engagement, a lot of uh, tools for participation and communication and decision making that results in, uh, in their mind, more just and equitable uh, spaces. Uh, one of the examples and how I got to know them uh, was I went to their Eco District Summit in Pittsburgh. Uh, in Millville, uh, Pittsburgh, a neighborhood in Pittsburgh became one of the first uh, communities east of uh, the Mississippi that really adopted their Eco District protocol. And there's a lot of levels to it, you know, and you'll find that looking at these different methods, everybody has their own vocabulary and they have their own criteria. So it's a little murky sometimes when you're comparing. Uh, but some of it is is really really useful. Uh, 
So Millvale um, used their eco district uh, principles and started to uh, estimate, you know, the positive impacts of big systems. So, you know, street networks, large parks, drainage areas, um, you know, um, more than one building, but you know, developments, uh, and and uh, visualized it sort of in that way. So. Um, the components of the plan that you see here that are closest to the right, which is closest to the river, a lot of that is already built now. Um, so they started that process and, you know, I went to Pittsburgh in, I guess, 2019, it was right before the uh, pandemic. Uh, and a lot of that's there. So in terms of thinking at that master plan, bigger scale, you know, it's a growing tool. And they've partnered now, interesting partnership with Partnership for Southern Equity, which is based in Atlanta. So Eco District started in Portland. They're partnering with uh, a partnership for uh, Southern Equity in Atlanta to try and develop more robust uh, equity and justice measures uh, learning from that particular group. A uh, number of you are taking the uh, public interest design certificate sequence, you know, and are familiar with Brian Bell. So I won't belabor it, but the seed uh, evaluator tool is another way of thinking about it. If there is uh, an issue with it from a landscape architecture standpoint, is that it has to be built. So uh, if you're trying to speculate on impacts, it's difficult because the tool in terms of evaluation um, requires it to be built and to do a little post occupancy. However, it's a uh, wheel that you see on the right in terms of the nine steps uh, is very useful. What it means is, you know, and with all these uh, evaluators is you kind of have to have a little bit of a sense of what you want to measure before you start. You know, so either working with your client or a community or others, um, defining kind of what you want to, so that you can actually do a baseline assessment. So when you come back around when it's done, uh, you can measure it again and see if it did anything. One thing that is good about it is it really uh, uh, values collaboration and um, communication and participation with the community or the client that you're serving. Um, and so that's that's a good thing uh, with regards to co-design. Um, so providing evidence that that occurred is you know, another story, but but it does place a premium on that as, as a key component to it. You know, one of the projects that's highlighted, you know, um, decidedly architecture. So most of the uh, seed awards every year are buildings, but yeah, exactly. Adam. Yeah, Parasite Park in New Orleans is one of the open spaces. And so among its other accolades, it's celebrated for how it dealt with stormwater, how it dealt with the community engagement process, particularly young people, um, you know, that kind of thing. So that's one of the examples of one that's really highlighted uh, through that network. Uh, Reimagine in the Civic Commons, which even Megan kind of gave a tip of the cap to. So. It's rare when you see like dueling nonprofits in the same space say, hey, yeah, they're pretty good. You know, usually it's like, no, they're trash. You need to use our metric. But this is not a trash metric. It's actually pretty good. Uh, Imagine the Civic Commons comes from the JPB Foundation and the Knight Foundation. They initially focused on what are called legacy cities, or what in the old days called the Rust Belt. So cities that had their heyday in the early 20th century tied to industrialization due to deindustrialization and migration south and that sort of thing to sort of uh, reduce themselves in population. So a lot of Northern cities are considered legacy cities. Um, and so they, with the loss of population and the loss of, in some cases, buildings and infrastructure, new opportunities for landscape, right? To do some of the things that couldn't have happened uh, with, with those things. So they wanted to come up with sort of a combination of the citizen science slash policy tool to help communities rethink that. So their pilot communities are you know, all over the country, but you know they have four general goals. You know, and this is coming back around. You're starting to see some you know similar patterns. This idea of civic engagement. You know, the idea of measuring that, like like you know, before you start, like a baseline of how people they think their level of access and agency um, uh, on the political process and decision making process, and then. Through the process, through incremental measures, surveys, you know, uh, other records, uh, seeing whether or not that goes up or goes down based on the investment in the public space. Socioeconomic mixing, they brought this up, right? So we started the whole environmental justice section, you know, saying, is this a race thing or is it a class thing? 
uh, in their mind, uh, you know, true public space uh, represents a certain kind of class mix. Now, how do you know that? How can you figure that out without falling into biases and stereotypes and that kind of thing? Uh, tough one. So that one, in some cases, deals with people willing to self-report, you know, what their uh, economic status is through surveys and interviews and that sort of thing, or uh, changes in uh, census tracts or census block group numbers from a demographic standpoint. But saying that these public spaces aren't just for a certain group of people, you know, well-educated, super wealthy elites, you know, or, you know, all working class, like the indicators that there are different groups of people coming together in a particular place is a, an indicator of a more uh, equitable and more just space. I think they put on the table and you know, they're evolving the tools to figure that out. Um, environmental sustainability. So the note, Megan, to you, if, with your question about like, hey, you know, are there things that, um, uh, the CSI, you know, landscape performance series, you can take aspects of that and plug in. I find their environmental sustainability measures pretty terrible. So that would be something I would recommend uh, to Bridget Marquis and all those people is like, you get rid of all that stuff and use the LPS instead because, you know, this is a little better. But at least they acknowledge it, right? They acknowledge that the, 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 the health, increased health of environmental systems in the public space is an indicator more broadly of, of justice and equity. And value creation, right? The final frontier, um, which is, uh, can local people uh, who were there before be first in line to generate economic opportunities and benefit from investments there? Uh, either through uh, using uh, public space investment to catalyze small business uh, enterprises, uh, workforce development, you know, um, associated with stabilizing communities and allowing people to stay in place and, and own land, own homes, and that sort of thing. Those are all sort of indicators of that. So, so it's an interesting four, you know, and they have a lot of uh, baseline reports, a lot of kits. This is, you know, one of their graphics, but I wanted to point to one that they didn't talk about um, very much, but I think is important, um, particularly regarding what we're dealing with, um, which uh, is a part of the Memphis uh, Riverfront vision, uh, which started in the uh, mid 2000s. Uh, of transforming uh, Memphis Riverfront into link park systems. And one thing that's really interesting about it is uh, in terms of dealing with equity and justice, uh, the Memphis Riverfront used to have a lot of parks that were associated with leaders of the Confederacy, right? So they had their Robert E. Lee statue and park. Uh, that's Nathan Bedford Forrest. If people don't know who that was, uh, the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and uh, uh, author of incredible atrocities uh, during the, the Confederacy who escaped, right? He was one of the uh, Confederate leaders who was never captured or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the namesake of Forrest Gump, which created a, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. But the, the point I'm making is that uh, they were there earlier advocating for public access to the waterfront. Well, they get rid of the pyramid. Mm. There's an excellent video online about the pyramid in Memphis. So I'll share a link to it. It's fascinating. Uh, there is a pyramid in Memphis. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, uh, uh, they started with this advocacy with the parks. This predates George Floyd, uh, murder of George Floyd, uh, renamed and removed that statue because people said this couldn't be a just and equitable space with this symbol sitting there uh, in everybody's face. Uh, the remains of Nathan Becker Forrest and his wife were also buried in this particular park. Uh, and after George Floyd, they exhumed those remains and gave them to a Confederate group. So uh, how an open space advocacy thing that's more focused on say ecology, sustainability, health, that sort of thing, built up enough momentum and enough community coalition uh, to advocate for the removal of Confederate statues, a cultural symbol is, is significant. Um, so, uh, uh, and a lot of uh, short-term high impact uh, projects like the one on the right uh, to get people reconnected to the water in some way. Uh, the Living Community Challenge this is part of the International Living Future Institute, uh, which I think some of you might be interested in or have experience with. Uh, is interesting. Uh, it's one of the few metrics that uh, puts a value on beauty. So, you know, the aesthetic measurement of beauty is 
you know, a dissertation. So how does one quantify or standardize beauty? Um, I have not done the deep dive on that, but through their pedal model, I kind of saw everything else kind of made sense. Equity, health and happiness, yeah. Inspiration, education, place, energy, good. Beauty and spirit, got no idea. So I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna investigate that. Because I think that's interesting. And even Sierra brought it up last night in her lecture um, that um, taking uh, Brian Stevenson's uh, great quote from Equal Justice Initiative, uh, that the opposite of poverty is not wealth, you know, the opposite of poverty is justice and that justice equals beauty. So uh, there's a little bit of uh, philosophical um, machinations going on, but I like the idea that they deal with that. Uh, next, we have to go to Georgia Tech to give a talk. Uh, this is one of the few living building challenge, like certified projects in the United States, uh, the Candida Lab. Uh, which Andrew Pogon did the landscape and a number of our alumni were actually engaged with the landscape, which is cool. Uh, so that's the rendering, uh, that's the real. Thing. So, you know, they have applied this metric to many scales of place, right? So from a building to a park and a site to a neighborhood to even larger units. Uh, they have a pretty big library of examples as well. Uh, so uh, just one example. Uh, and the uh, next frontier, I think, um, even at NC State, uh, there's an effort now uh, to start coding classes based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So they're going to start creating lists of classes that align uh, with those aspirations. So speaking previously to Pittsburgh, when I mentioned eco districts, while I was there, I met a guy named Fred Brown. Uh, Fred Brown is the CEO of a philanthropy called the Forbes Funds, uh, which does a lot of social uh, equity work uh, from an economic, financial, sort of workforce development side. So we've had a number of conversations, and I understand it conceptually, but haven't figured it out like practically yet. But what he's been doing is uh, trying to come up with return on investment measures that are tied directly to UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that's kind of what this chart is showing. Um, so the first goal of no poverty, right? um, you know, how do you turn that into a language that, say, a developer or a city official or a designer can understand? Um, in Pittsburgh uh, context, it talks about uh, basic needs and stability, stabilizing people's lives and communities um, has all these secondary benefits that help people get out of poverty. And we've learned in other parts of the world, can we you know, apply that you know, within the United States? And based on that, one dollar invested results in five dollars and ten cents in return. Right. So, taking a lot of these social values and you know going down the full like neoliberal rabbit hole, but in a language that people can kind of grab, grab with, right? So they can say, "Hey, I can, you know, I think it's cheaper to build a jail, you know, or you know, I need you know the, some kind of menial labor that doesn't pay a living wage, but not aware of." the systems within which that is nested, that the sort of the domino effect it has on all these other systems. You know, so I think it's, it's, it's in development. Uh, he's had success, for example, uh, getting other philanthropies. Pittsburgh is stunning in philanthropy. Like if you go to Pittsburgh and see what the philanthropic community, you can come back to Raleigh and cry and be like, you know, what the philanthropic community do around here? It gave us a really cool park. Uh, the uh, uh, Museum of Art Park is from the good nights so god bless them but you know between uh you know forbes and heinz and you know just all these really deep philanthropies um he is making a difference uh in you might say the immaterial parts of it but i think that's the next frontier is uh, in terms of a common language like saying you and sustainable development goals you know uh apply to everybody so why can't that be the baseline rubric that we use moving forward um, but this is not well developed yet. So I wanted to talk through a few of them uh, that were in the readings and introduce a few ideas from the others to kind of augment what you heard uh, from Megan with her experience. Um, any questions about any of that? Are you all leaning towards a certain tool right now, based on what you know, you can always change it. Which one do you think is closest to what you might want to investigate?
I, I have a question maybe about, about what's missing. And mm -hmm. Maybe this is just a limitation of my knowledge, but I feel like the USGBC's lead uh, framework for assessing a building or a landscape or a neighborhood is a pretty popular one, um, but it's missing from this list. Has USGBC just really dropped the ball on DEI? You know what, that's a really good question. Um, and that is a good observation. Um, I know that the, at least the equity and justice communities that I end up interacting with never talk about it. The, the closest to measures for landscapes and for communities is, is lead ND, uh, uh, neighborhood development, um, which really other than in, in some ways the seed evaluated to a stronger uh, than that with regards to there's, there's it, it favors the material and the landscape performance components of it, um, uh, but doesn't really credit significantly to the point where you would not get certified based on things like community engagement yeah, or paying attention to culture. Um, and so um, it, it's not a bad metric, uh, I'm not trying to exclude it for that reason, but just trying to present the ones that uh, I'm aware of that people are talking about. But for people who don't know what Brian's talking about, the USGBC, United States Green Building Council, uh, which actually was emerged from a bunch of architects who were trying to bring uh, metrics for sustainable practices to the AIA. And AIA was like, no, nah, we don't want to hear that job. You know? So they were uh, entrepreneurial, said we're going to build our own organization, we're going to make this happen. You know, they were developing metrics for building performance. Uh, you know, if you've ever heard like LEED certified, you know, uh, what is it, silver, gold, is there such a thing as platinum lead certification? Yeah. Is that a real thing? Yeah. 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 All right. So, you know, they're floundering. And then uh, during the Clinton administration, uh, uh, they persuade uh, the uh, general accounting office uh, for the federal government to uh, require lead certification for all federal buildings. And that's when lead emerged, right? So saying that every federal courthouse, every federal facility had to be lead certified they created that sort of value chain. Uh, and so then they got even extra uh, entrepreneurial and said, well, you gotta be LEED certified in order to use the LEED guidelines. And so we're gonna start these trainings all over the country uh, that you gotta pay to get, take a test, get LEED certified. Uh, yes, you can change the survey. Yes, you just, just fill that out again. Let's do it again. Uh, uh, yeah, so so they 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 started with building. Now, from a landscape architecture standpoint, uh, if you don't irrigate the site, you can still get lead certified for your building, right? Because that's the biggest performance impact landscape wise for structures. So landscape architects start losing their minds, and that's when uh, sustainable sites emerged. Uh, so around the Lady Bird Johnson Wildfire Center in Texas. People started convening, talking about native plants, uh, uh, alternative ways of dealing with soil, dealing with environmental components. So, so sustainable sites emerged as kind of on the side, uh, and now they're merged. So, sustainable sites is now connected to lead, and then lead expanded from building to neighborhood development using um, new urbanist uh, urban design strategies, which pissed off a lot of people who don't like new urbanism. Uh, so there's there's a lot of politics with it. I'm not against it, uh, but I think that the challenge uh, to think about with that is with regards to what we've been talking about and hearing, you know, uh, outside of the material and energy consumption and performance that is required to be LEED certified, what else can it offer uh, to enable these other things that we're talking about? So as a starting point, I think it's fine, but I think it's going to take some critical thinking um, to use it. Long-winded answer, apologize, but wanted to give some air time to why I wasn't listed. I might turn that question around on you, Kofi, and ask, what is, do you have a preferred tool or something that you've used or one of these or, um, or what has your experience been in using these tools and evaluating landscapes? 
Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I think um, it depends on what kind of landscape you're looking at. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in more urban landscapes that are more people centric. Uh, and so the measure of performance would be how the people are doing. Which to me, the reimagined civic commons with the more robust environmental sustainability angle is just fine for that. Uh, it may not be appropriate if you're interested in um, big conservation land, you know, uh, you know, relationships to big scale habitat or communities that are dependent or relying on the landscape, rural landscapes probably doesn't apply at all. Um, uh, uh, so there, I think there's like a scale thing to think through. Um, Cause I do think that there is a place for arguing that doing things that are right ecologically, environmentally, do tie to equity and justice. Um, uh, and it's not just based on the human use component of it. Um, I think there's a place for that. So, but for me, just in terms of the scale of places I work on it and that kind of stuff, I tend to gravitate towards um, that DIY kit, to be honest with you. But, you know, it's just me. No one bias, y'all. All right. Others, anybody thinking about one of these? Brian's going to fix lead. Right. Give us some thought. It's important. I don't think. Does everybody fill out the survey? Okay. I did, but I think I'm going to change my answer okay okay well uh maybe what we can do uh let me go through the results um and see if we can do a quick sort just so you can have a sounding board you can introduce yourself to people who have similar interests and um we're considering similar things or just maybe in the same point where they haven't gotten a place to get started so you all can you know, have some conversations. Um, so it's going to take me a minute to go through the results so I can do some quick sorting. But um, but uh, if you fill it out, you know, the next five minutes or so, I'm just going to get on that Google sheet and start putting people together. So these aren't permanent groups. So if you're worried about like, oh man, you know, I'm stuck with, with this, you're not stuck with it, you know. So we've still got a couple of weeks before we have to pin down, you know, a place and an attempt at starting to uh, devise a strategy for how you might. So the point with this is that you don't have to produce the data for it, right? We're not actually measuring it. We're designing a strategy if we were gonna measure it. Right? Uh, and it could be a hybrid, right? It could be a little of this, a little of that, or something we haven't looked at so far. So it's, in that regard, it's open-ended. All right, so I'm gonna uh, turn my camera off for a few minutes, look at this spreadsheet and, uh, and we'll start jumping into these breakout rooms. All right, I'll be back.
I'm gonna head to the breakout room, my friend. <laughs>